Welcome to the Knife Junkie Deep Cut. It's a chance for us to go really deep and nerd out on a certain topic in knives. And, uh, you know, we'll take about a half hour here to, to discuss some real mm, tight issue th that uh, Josiah has dealt with. This is Josiah DeMille of Millet Knives. Josiah, thanks for coming on the show, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here. Well, last time when you were on the show and we had our interview and we, you know, I, I got to know, uh, know you and know Millet Knives a little bit better. You started talking about some challenges in the morphing karambit. And that's why we decided to bring you back onto the show because it was, uh, you were talking about some really, um, I don't know. I would imagine for for a maker who's taking someone else's designs and producing it, you ran into some serious roadblocks um, on that on that. And before we actually get to the topic of the Morphin Karam, but I have to tell you, one of my awesome uh, listeners, uh, <laughs> Mister Filato, gave me his uh, his Perpetua because he heard me going on and on about how I missed out on it and how much I like it, and yeah. he uh, he hooked me up. I love this knife. Cool. Yeah. That was a, that was an interesting project too. <laughs> interesting how? Oh, a lot of respects. Uh, you know, that, that knife started out right after the uh, patent ended with Benchmade to do the, that style lock. Mm. Um, and so there was, there was a lot of research done as far as navigating the legalities of, of producing that knife after the, the end of that patent. And, you know, I have to still be careful because the, the term uh, access lock is actually trademarked by Benchmade. And so even though it's a, it's a similar locking mechanism, you can't use that term in your marketing campaign, you know. And so a lot of people have gotten really creative on what they call that now. But, uh, you know, that was just one thing. And that was really kind of our first um, first knife at that entry level price point and so it was very interesting dealing with the partners that we had on that on that and getting the price down on an american-made product that it could be sold the way it was and it definitely presented some challenges you know we we talked about or you know we're here today to kind of talk about some of the challenges and there was definitely some on those and those that got into that knife especially on the first uh, round release <clears throat> excuse me you know, there was some, uh, some material issues. Um, you know, we, we were pressured as a manufacturer to continue to drive the cost down, um, and, and make some sacrifices where normally we don't do that when we're dealing with the more of the mid tech market. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and in, in our, in our definition, um, you know, the mid tech, is more of the the higher end you know full titanium materials um the premium knife steels you know the best of the best you know full bearings if you can add it in there like it needs to be in there in, in my mm -hmm. opinion you know and and the perpetual is a little different you know it's uh it's uh, liners with g10 scales um it's got a really nice quality steel to it um but i wouldn't necessarily consider the premium steel not like anything from bowler or uda home or even some of the higher cpn stuff you know mm -hmm. the, the s35 now the new magna cut or even the carpenter stuff the cts xhp the 204p any of those so um going with some of those definitely uh or going with the uh, nitro v definitely helped us keep the price down but being the nitrogen infused steels it offered a pretty good um a pretty good steal for what what we offered it at so you know we, we had to really kind of <clears throat> evaluate that and how we were going to approach it and uh, unfortunately we we ended up like i said getting kind of pressured into using a steel on the clip and the clip is one of the big big factors that we took a lot of heat on on the first round of those um why well we ended up using the wrong stainless um in order to maintain the spring properties, you have to use a, a 400 series grade stainless. If you go with a 300 series, um, it doesn't have any spring uh, memory because uh, mm -hmm. you have to harden it in order to, to, re to receive that property in the metal. And so even though you can make thumb studs, you can make pivots, you can make backspacers out of a 300 series stainless, and it makes beautiful parts, um, especially fresh off a machine, 
<clears throat> the uh, obviously that doesn't work for a clip. So we went with the round two. We talked to the customer like, you know, you guys wanted to scrimp on that. Like we we tried the three hundred series. Clearly, it didn't work. Um, we need to we need to offer another clip. So on the second round, we we revamped. Um, they gave us a little bit more budget to actually go with the 400 series and heat treat it and process it correctly. And then, and even then we weren't super excited about that. So Millet actually offered a titanium version. So mm. um, for a little while there, we were like, Hey, if you don't like either of those clips, you know, aftermarket or uh, Millet's known for doing aftermarket clips. So here you go. Here's a nice titanium one. <laughs> well, what what feedback were you hearing about the 300 style clip? Were people bending them and yeah, breaking they, them? Well, when you whenever you bend them, they just they just bend out of shape and then they don't return. They just stay there. So if it snagged on something or mm. maybe you had a, a a thick material pant and it it just bends it out and it's just done. And you can kind of bend it back, but there's not really any any spring memory properties to that steel. So right. You'll be doing that every time. Exactly. Exactly. And so not not very not obviously not effective at all. So so the perpetua was a drop knife. That was that was the distributor and I would assume the client in this case. Um when something like that happens and uh Millet being the OEM, um how does the responsibility kind of get parsed out? Is it is it all up to uh, drop or do they lay this on you? Well, I mean, the customer always. I mean, nobody ever really wants to take responsibility, right? So mm -hmm. it's like sort of getting into a pointing finger game. Um, we we try to do the best we can to outline what we're doing in a project. So when the customer approaches us, there's there's a there's a really fine line that we that we dance like hey okay what do you want i mean we will satisfy what you want and coming from a a job shop machine shop background the way that process works is a customer will approach us they'll give us engineered blueprints and say hey we need you to make this whether that's a single component whether that's a an uh, assembly of parts whatever that is but within that engineered blueprint, we get tolerances, which <clears throat> for those that don't understand what tolerances are, um, on the computer, it's easy to have perfect dimensions. You know, <laughs> when you draw something up in SolidWorks or, you know, whatever software you're using, you make it the dimension you want and it's, it's perfect, right? But in the real world, there's there's wear there's fluctuation there's temperature that affects it there's human error and so in manufacturing there's there's a range of tolerance and so when engineers design stuff and they create a blueprint they say okay if you stay within this dimension and this dimension this component will work and when you tighten that range it becomes more costly because now as a manufacturer we have to say okay well in order to consistently maintain a tighter range or a tighter tolerance, this is what it's going to require. Better machinery, better tooling, more, atten more attentive uh, staff, you know, usually mm -hmm. staff with more experience. And so costs go up. <clears throat> um, so when we're, when we're dealing with customers, we, we try and outline everything and it's, it's always a challenge because a lot of customers that come to us are, are new customers. They're, they want to get into making knives. Mm -hmm. So they say, Hey, you know, we, we want you to help us. And so we say, well, okay, we, we can offer recommendations. We can point you in the right direction, but realistically, I, I really try to avoid telling somebody what to do. And so I, I, I want them to be the creator for them to give me their specifications mm. and then I will do that. And you mentioned, you know, we duplicate a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of people have brought knives in that they, that their customs and now they're bringing to us and say, Hey, I have a huge demand for our customs. I want to make this more available to others. So or we say, okay, well, how do we go about replicating this? <clears throat> you know, are there, is everything, um, <clears throat> repeatable. Can we repeat this in a large scale 
compared to somebody that kind of go that goes up to a grinder and they say, yeah, mm. that's about right. You know, or give that kind of, yeah, I like it. You know, how do, how does my shop create your art in a way that's acceptable by your standards over and over and over and over, over and over and over again. You know, it's, it's easy to, to go up. Well, I, let me correct myself. It's not easy, but when an artist is creating their work of art for them to say that's good or that's not, I mean, it's their work of art. They have that, that say that discretion, right? I don't have that say. I, I don't necessarily know what they want. <clears throat> when we run into a challenge or a little detail that's like, okay, do you want me to go this way or this way? I have to check in with them. Mm -hmm. And so how do we how do we clarify that and minimize that right out of the gate? And so we try to make sure we have as many meetings as we can. We try to understand the intention, the focus, what the end goal is. And we document that. And so in the case for the clip, for the for the Perpetua, we had that outlined in the scope of the project. And so when it's like, okay, this is bad. We said, well, we outlined in the before we even started the project what we were going to do as we discussed. Therefore, it's in the contract. That's how it was going to be done. We don't always know it's going to work or not. You know, mm. if we follow the directions of the customers, that it's their product. <clears throat> now, because we've done this quite a bit, I can usually head people off and like, nope, that's that's a bad idea. Like, that's not going to work. We need to go this route. And so that's that's where the advantage of my knife making experience comes in. Is I've made the mistakes like using three hundred series when I should not have used three hundred <laughs> series or. You know, if we were doing um, a button lock and <clears throat> we used uh, 416 and 416 only gets half hard, what we call half hard. So it only gets up to about 40, a little over 40 Rockwell on the C scale. When realistic on a button lock, because it's a it's a lock part and engages the hardened blade, you need to be within five points of your hardness of the blade to prevent galling. Sometimes that's trial and error, right? So that's yeah. when it comes in as millet. So <clears throat> we made the correction on drop and we made, we offered some options and, you know, I, I, I still field a lot of calls about the perpetua wow. people have issues. And I generally try and refer them to drop say, Hey, you know, this drops name is on this drop supports this drop. I mean, this was their project. I'm the manufacturer. If they don't take care of them just because we're the kind of people we are, I try to help the customers when I can, yeah. you know, if it's just sending them a little part or something like that, I'll try to make sure they're taken care of. But my, my name isn't on the box. It's not on the knife. It was used in the marketing material, which is fine. You know, mm -hmm. we, we're used to that, but <clears throat> as far as responsibility lies, that sometimes that, that gets a little gray, right? Right. And so, like I said, I, I try to, I try to be, be the best I can as far as helping customers and situations. Now, obviously if it's got our name on it, our brand, absolutely. No questions asked hundred percent. We'll make sure you're happy when it's going through customers. Sometimes it gets a little tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's up to them. It's their, it's their thing. You're, you're in this case, the tool. Uh, or the you know to to make that knife happen, but it's their knife. Right. Um, so last time we spoke, <clears throat> after after we uh, after we were off air, you were telling me some of the tribulations and trials uh, that went into making uh, Joe Caswell's morphing karambit. Right. Um, and I thought it was fascinating. Uh, just oh my god, it's like you make one move, and then ten other moves are affected. Um, so. Yeah. Tell us, tell us, this is what I really want to hear. Tell us about the experience of, of making uh, the knife, uh, the, the morphing karambit for Joe Caswell as a, uh, as a mid tech and what the tolerance issues in this case were, cause this was a tolerance thing, right? Yeah. I mean, this, this was one of those projects and I, I absolutely love Joe and I love working with Joe. He is a great guy and I, I would work with him hands down anytime again. Um, 
you know, he, he approached us with this project and I looked at it and I knew it was going to be a challenge out of the gate. Um, but this was definitely a situation where the issue started kind of spiraling out of control. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, the first the first issue we ran into was uh, the anodizing. So on that knife, we used a 7075 grade aluminum. So the best the best grade aluminum you can get. And we CNC'd out the frames. And so the specifications were 7075 aluminum. We're going to send it out. We're going to get it hard anodized. Now, anodizing uh varies quite a bit depending on materials you know when you talk about anodizing with titanium versus anodizing aluminum it's two very different processes it requires two different application techniques different setups um alum uh, anodizing aluminum is a much uh, larger and more expensive process to do Fortunately, it's much more common than anodizing titanium in a, manu in a, in a large scale production because aluminum is so widely used. And so there's a, there's a lot of applicators that do offer uh, aluminum anodizing. So anyways, I have one that I, I have used on, uh, on the industrial side of my business when we've, used, when we've uh, had to anodize engineering components from engineering companies. And so I talked to them like, hey, <clears throat> you know, we need to do what we call a, a grade three or a type three anodizing. Mm -hmm. And the standards are a type two or type three. Type two is more of a decorative. It's a it's a surface type anodizing. It doesn't have uh, penetration into the material quite as much. Okay. It uses different chemicals. And so they have to use different baths when they when they dip the parts and um, so anyways, so the difference with type three is it creates a, a harder surface. <clears throat> and so in the scenario of the morphine crumbit, because there's going to be friction on the frame with the, the arms, mm -hmm. uh, it had to be friction resistant, essentially. Uh, we didn't want galling or anything like that, which, you know, aluminum, if it's uncoated, it will, it'll, it'll gall up really fast and be a nightmare. When, when you say gall up, what do you mean by that? What does gall mean? So when you have two different uh, materials rubbing against each other, if they are soft or if they uh, have galling qualities, they'll they'll get sticky. Um, they'll oh, heat up, okay. they'll get sticky, okay. and they'll almost they'll all but weld themselves to each other. Oh, okay. Um, you know, we get, we get similar things when, uh, you have electrolysis, when you have two diff dissimilar metals that are, are together and working back and forth, or even just sitting there, you know, they'll, they'll go through a chemical reaction and, uh, kind of fuse themselves together. <coughs> galling, galling is very similar, okay. but usually it's related to the friction and the heat generated with friction and on certain materials that are soft um that happens very quickly and aluminum is definitely one of them um in fact titanium uh galls really bad as well hmm. um that's uh that's the uh, origin of like lock inserts on um frame right. Lock holders. right right because if you're rubbing direct titanium on your lock arm onto a blade it will gall unless you treat it with something to prevent that galling and there's different techniques some people have heat treated it some people have used uh, lock inserts. Some people have done carbonizing techniques right. or they infuse carb, uh, carbide. Um, so anyways, so we're like, okay, we'll get these parts anodized, get them going. Now, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, American uh, made run of these karambits, uh, it was a pretty substantial size order. And so we, we, we geared all up. We got going on production. You know, we had hundreds of parts made and we sent them down to be anodized so my anodite i i spec'd everything out on my purchase order said hey i need you guys to type three black um get these things back to me when you're done so while that was out being processed you know i started working on the other components the uh the lock arms the blade etc so the the frames come back and we start assembling them and they seem pretty good 
So I sent a first sample to Joe and he had some prototypes that he had done in his shop and he had proofed everything out and engineered, which is fantastic. Joe's great and he's a very technical mind and he loves understanding what's going on and how things work. And so we were on the phone nearly every day just going over, hey, what's the status? How's things going? How's things progressing? Uh, what are the issues you're running into? And then, and then we'd work through those issues. So he sends me a message. He says, hey, we got a serious problem. I said, mm -hmm. oh, what's that? He's like, this, uh, this anodizing is wrong. And I was like, well, what do you mean it's wrong? And I, so I, I'm freaking out. You know, I'm, I'm digging through my paperwork. I'm like, no, I got spec out right here. Type three. They returned the, the paperwork. It says type three anodize. I'm like, what, what's going on? He's like, uh, the friction, it's breaking through this coating and it's starting to stick and gall. And I was like, uh, you know, from my standpoint, I, I did everything I could do. And so we started investigating and researching. So the interesting thing about uh, anodizing, especially a hard anodizing on aluminum, is there's a certain amount of the coating that penetrates into the surface of the material and then there's a certain amount that builds up the material and the anodizers they can control that to a certain extent and so on this coating they can do like a one thousandth of an inch penetration in the material which so it's kind of like an etch right they'll etch it into the material mm -hmm. so it penetrates into the pores <clears throat> and then they build this coating up and so you can you can adjust your tolerances or have to be aware of your tolerances when they do this buildup on the surface. So I started calling them like, hey, what's going on with this? We started researching. There wasn't enough etch penetration into the material for one, and then there wasn't enough buildup. And so whatever that, that applicator did, they, they shortcutted it, essentially. They did the real cheap mm. anodizing. And so when I when I confronted him about it, I'm like, hey, you know, what what's the deal? You say you did type three, but I'm not getting yeah. the results, the characteristics that a type three NNI should give me. Well, after further research with between Joe and I, we realized that it's actually quite subjective what type three anodizing means. And so talking to some other applicators, we realized, well, to get the anodizing we want, there's a certain call out, a mil spec call out that you can reference that tells these anodizers exactly what you want. Hmm. Like, great. Okay. <laughs> That's nice to know now. Yeah. Now we know. Now I'm several hundred parts deep into this coating that is now no good. So I'm thousands of, thousands of dollars into the material into the machining, into the coating. Now what, right? <laughs> yeah, and into the process, you know, you're already flowing with it. You got Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and now I've got other parts that are coming through and now I'm at a I'm at a huge stall because now I have to go back and figure out what to do with the frames. So so let me get this straight though. The um the the practical effect that the user would feel uh, after a short while of using this karambit with the with the wrong anodization, is that the tol is that the tolerances would start to loosen? Is that correct? Actually, it would just completely fail. Oh, you would wear through the coating, and the arms would start sticking to the frame, and it would just seize up and lock up. And oh my you'd be gosh, about what's going on? And so you know, most people would disassemble and say, "Hey, why is it getting so sticky? Why is it stuck? Why won't it rotate?" And, you know, they'd see some weird tearing looking on where the uh, where the arm is pivoting on that frame. And, you know, they maybe clean it up, sand it up and it would work temporarily until it start to gall again. And then they'd run into the same issue and then they'd be mad and frustrated. And, you know, what could be a beautiful product is now. A, a, a lead weight. <laughs> so, so, you, oh man, that hurts. So you had to set about to make that right. What did you do? So first thing we did is I, you know, my, my applicator, I said, Hey, this is wrong. I need it done this other way. Can you do that? And they, they confessed. They said, we can't do that, that level of anodizing. <clears throat> I said, okay, that's fair. 
I understand that. Um, but you need to get my parts back to a serviceable state. <clears throat> so with anodizing, they can actually strip that coating off through another chemical process. So I said, great, let's do it. Let's strip it all off, get these things cleaned up, call it good, and then I'll take them to another applicator that can facilitate this, uh, <clears throat> this better level type three. So uh, they did that, they stripped it down. Of course that presented the next problem was when they stripped it, they had to remove material to take the coating because because it penetrates penetration into that and so yeah you know they didn't they didn't take the full etch penetration you know but there was still some penetration and so for those that know the morphine karambit um there's a lot of internal parts right there's a locking ring that sets down inside the frame and so anytime you have a round part sitting in a hole any change in dimension is doubled uh, you have oh, one geez, side yeah. and the other side. Yeah. So even though it was only a half of a thousandth, multiply that by two. Now you've got 1000th variance and where we're already, you know, tight tolerances to keep that ring snug in there to keep it from moving around because it is the locking mechanism mm -hmm. suddenly that threw us over tolerance or out of tolerance because now the hole that that locking ring was supposed to go in is now too large in diameter right so we're like great so joe actually found the new a new applicator for us somebody that he had used before and they did a great job and he went in and sat down with them and went through it like hey this is what we need um, this is what's going to happen. So, you know, he helped, he really helped out with that side of it and helped us get it figured out. And so we sent all the parts to them and they were actually able to build up <laughs> on the surface, which was obviously more than what the other applicator was able to do. And so we were able to bring those parts back into tolerance. That's amazing. So, so just through the, the application of, of the anodization, they were able to, you know, with penetration into the metal and then building up above the metal, they were able to get it back to exactly where you needed it to have the proper tolerances. Yep. Yep. That, that's an amazing. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, that was, that was the anodizing issue that we ran into that. And then, well, I guess one of them, the other, that led us into the next problem is once we got the anodizing solution figured out that that led us into the next problem was, with all this going on with the, the incorrect anodizing, the stripping and the re-anodizing, now we have all these holes that have threads in them. So can you really build up threads with anodizing? Not really. <laughs> yeah. And so fortunately, uh, they were good and they were still strong and we you know we did the calcs on the the, th the thread strength and the the amount of thread that it's grabbing and and holding and and everything was good on that on that front ah uh, that's cool so you yeah. did an analysis of the threads to make sure that that they would seat properly with the screws and stuff and that the anodization hadn't sort of filled in those threads to a right, point where right. nothing would grip yeah, because it's it's pretty insane. I mean, there's there's a lot of engineering that goes into just threads. You know, how much thread versus the diameter of the thread, how much percentage of thread you have in a hole. Um, you know, you can have everywhere from forty to eighty percent thread engagement in any given thread and bolt scenario, and. You know, some scenarios where you've got really strong materials or it's really difficult to work with, <clears throat> they'll open up that tolerance. They'll go um, less thread engagement. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the percentage of thread engagement you have versus your diameter and how many threads you're grabbing, you know, there's there's different strengths and, and capabilities uh, calculated there. So... <clears throat> So in the end, uh, with this particular experience with the uh, Morphin Karambit and then also, you know, with other experiences, what would you, not that there are tons of, uh, 
U.S. knife companies like you because there are not, but hopefully there are popping up here in the future. That'd be awesome to see. What would be <laughs> what would what would be your bit of advice? Because uh, man, it sounds like making the morphing karambit may have may have uh, been like an expensive school. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you probably learned a lot from that, probably didn't make as much as you initially planned because of all of the retro uh, work and all that. What would be um, the main bit of advice you would give anyone who wanted to start an outfit similar to Millet where you're, where you're making knives for other people? Um, I guess realistically is, is, the biggest thing would be just understand the project, you know, un try to understand the full scope before you get involved, because it's always the little unforeseen things that will get you. Right. Those little things will come up and bite you. Like they say, the devil is in the details. And if right, you, right. if you don't know all the details, that's where he's hiding somewhere in there. It's always the unforeseen stuff that you haven't planned for. So uh, uh, as we wrap, what do you what do you have in the offing that we can look forward to from <laughs> from Millet Knives? Uh, man, I was actually I was actually thinking about that um, before I came on, and um, we've got probably ten uh, customers that we are working on their stuff right now, and a lot of them are new companies that are coming up with some really cool stuff. Hmm. Um, a lot of them I don't necessarily want to say just yet just because uh they're going to do their own intro into the market and and come in with a with a splash but you know we are working with uh two customers right now that are have designs that are very similar to the perpetua and so we've been able to dial them in and mm -hmm. obviously learn from our, our our issues and mistakes on that one and they're they're really cool Re i'm really excited they're gonna be fun uh obviously they're very budget friendly Great. But yeah, very good quality. Um, one of them is using MagnaCut, um, the brand new steel from uh, Crucible. Yeah. So that's uh, that's pretty awesome. But I've got uh, 500 pounds hitting the shop here any day now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, I just there's fixed blades coming through. Um, several new companies. Little some of the little guys are just like, hey, I've always wanted to make a knife. Let's do this. Um, I got a gentleman back east. He's got a lot of amazing ideas coming through. Um, he'll hit the market with a splash. Uh, we got some chef stuff, some kitchen knives, chef's knives coming through mm. um, of all sorts of variety. Um, yeah, it's exciting, exciting stuff. And we've got a new collaboration with, uh, and I'll actually drop his name, a uh, designer called, uh, he, his name of his company is Titanium Designs. Titanium. Titanium. Oh, uh, Tanium Designs. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so we've got some collaboration stuff for folders coming down. Very intricate, very detailed stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, really excited about that. Um, yeah, you know, we've talked about some of the past. You know, our buddy up in Newfoundland. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's he's chomping a bit. Antsy to do some stuff. So we got some <laughs> stuff that works with him. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's I, I'm, I'm really excited. It's a good time at Mill and Knives. Um, new customers, existing customers. Uh, so yeah, you know, uh, st stay in touch and, uh, we'll start showing some stuff as it comes off the floor. Oh, we'll do. We'll do. And it's a great time. It's an exploding market. People are just more and more and more into knives and especially into high quality and everyone loves American made. So, uh, yep. there you have it. So, uh, uh, Josiah, thanks for coming on. I also want to r remind people that you don't just do, um, collaborations and OEM work, you are, you know, you have your own shingle, you, you have your own designs. Of course, you got to do what pays the bills first, right. but, but uh, you are working on your own designs as well. Yep. So uh, we're all really excited to see what, what comes out of our favorite American OEM next. So thanks cool. for joining us uh, on the deep cut, Josiah. Absolutely. Take care. Talk to you soon. All righty, sir. Take care. Yep. Bye. Bye.